This is Robert Stearns. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. I really believe that learning is one of the greatest joys in life. And one of the greatest ways to learn is simply to have meaningful conversations, both with those who come from a similar background as yours, as well as those whose background might be very different. So my hope is that as we connect and converse with leaders from all around the world, that we will learn and grow together. If you're new with us, hit the subscribe button and we'll deliver the new episodes to you right away. So wherever you are, on a run, in the car, at the kitchen table with some coffee, welcome to the conversation. Welcome indeed, everybody. It is Thursday night and there's no better place to be than right here at Bishop and the Rabbi. It's good to see you all here tonight. Happy to be together and uh, really excited, very excited about tonight's uh, special edition. Um, I'll share more about our special guest in a few moments. A first timer. Uh, we have a first time guest with us tonight on Bishop and the Rabbi. Uh, as you come in and as the room fills up, do us a favor and sign in. Let us know who you are, where you're watching from. And then we've got one request of you, and that is that you would hit the share button. And you can share whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or whichever uh, medium you're tuning into tonight. Uh, go ahead and hit the like, the subscribe button, but most importantly, the share button. That helps us get the word out uh, and lets people know about Bishop and the Rabbi. And Go ahead and sign in. Tell us who you are and where you're watching from. Uh, we love to uh, connect with everybody. And there's a great community that is formed around this incredible concept that we call Jerusalem-based Christianity. Um, what did Christianity look like pre-Constantine? Um, what, what did the community of Jesus look like, um, you know, uh, in, in, in the first century, you know, before Paul's journeys resulted in Gentile churches and Gentile understandings, what were the original followers of Jesus? What was their worldview? What were their prayers? What were their holidays? What was their theology about the last days? What was their theology about Jerusalem? Uh, is the Son of Man the same thing as the Messiah? That's an interesting conversation to have sometime. Uh, you know, lots of things to delve into as we get deeper into this incredible book, uh, this amazing book that has guided us and led us for centuries and indeed millennia. So we're super glad that you are here. I have a few quick announcements that I need to make. One very, 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 very important announcement, which is that um, starting... Soon, starting Sunday, um, my sons and I are going on a much, much needed, much anticipated um, time away. Uh, we are headed to Jerusalem uh, for the next few weeks just to spend time together as a family. I gave my children the choice. I said, we can go anywhere in the world you'd like to go for vacation. I've got amazing kids. I said, it's your choice. You've been so good this year, wherever you want to go. And they said, Dad, we want to go to Jerusalem. That's where they chose. That's where they wanted to go for our family vacation. Not Hawaii, not, God forbid, Orlando. Uh, uh, they chose uh, Jerusalem. So we are heading over in uh, on Sunday to uh, Israel. So the next three weeks, uh, Bishop and the Rabbi, we're going to take an end of summer break. All right. We don't usually do that, but we're going to take an end of summer break the next three weeks. And we will be back live the first Thursday in September, right after Labor Day. That's where we will pick things up. Now, we will not take a break uh, on Torah Tuesdays. All right. We're going to continue on with Torah Tuesdays every Tuesday, so you can continue to tune in. Um, but uh, it's four in the morning in Jerusalem right now. And as much as I love you, I just wasn't getting up at four in the morning while I'm on my vacation, even though I love you. Um, hey, sign in, everybody. I'm looking for you to... Oh, there everybody is. Okay, people are popping in. There it is. Sign in. Tell us who's watching, where you're watching from. Welcome. Uh, Jeannie and Peekskill and Deborah and Lancaster 
and Elena and Terry and Mom Loretta and uh, everybody who's signing in. Great to see you all. Sign in. Tell me who you are, where you're watching from, and uh, and that'll be great. So we will keep Torah Tuesdays, all right? That's at noon every Tuesday. Go to TorahTuesdays.com, and I will be broadcasting live from Jerusalem for Torah Tuesdays. But for Bishop and the Rabbi, we will take the next three weeks off. To, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow and Saturday, I will be ministering in New Jersey at Resting Place. You can go to eagleswings.org under the events tag for all of the details. But where is Resting Place? What town in New Jersey is it? It is in Over Woodland Park, Woodland Park, New Jersey. Uh, okay, Karen has just signed in from Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome, Karen. Anne is here from Wernersville, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Anne. Um, so if you're anywhere in the tri-state area, tomorrow evening at 7.30 and Saturday morning at 10, I'll be ministering in Woodland Park, New Jersey at Resting Place. And it's going to be an amazing, amazing conference. So join me there. Uh, then Sunday, I'll be ministering at the Tabernacle. We'll be introducing our brand new uh, staff pastor, uh, Pastor Doug Reed, who's going to be with us. We're so excited that Pastor Doug has joined our staff. We honor him. We honor his wonderful wife, Sam, and their amazing kids. So we're going to introduce Pastor Doug on Sunday morning to our um, Tabernacle family. And then we're going to drive down to Newark and head off to Israel. Uh, some of you are joining us in Israel on Awake Jerusalem on September 27th. Um, that trip is closed, so you can pray for us, but we've sold out. That trip has completely sold out, um, so we're heading over on September 27th. We are going to do, this is important, we are going to do some incredible broadcasting from Israel that week. I don't want to give it away, but there is one thing in particular, the last week of September, that is going to be mind-blowing. I'm so over the moon, excited about this. So look for this coming the last week of September. We're going to be doing some live broadcasting from Israel, along with our partner ministry, Kathy, the Christian agency for Israel. So be looking for that. Hello, Janine and Rick from Boston, New York. Welcome to you. Um, and then finally, uh, September 15th at 7 p.m. is our Heckler Legacy Society meeting. You are all invited. It is free. There is no charge. It's an important meeting. Uh, it will be a great blessing to your life. So uh, be a part of that. Go to the website, eagleswings.org forward slash legacy and sign up for that upcoming event. All right, everybody. Great to see you here. We've got a great chat going on. Lots of folks filling up both on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, and we're so excited to welcome tonight a dear friend. Um, you know, this growing field of Jewish-Christian relations, it's a pretty small neighborhood. There's not so many of us hanging out in this neighborhood. Um, and uh, one of the people who is on the scene and making his mark is Rabbi Pesach Waliki. He is an Orthodox rabbi and one of the world's leaders in uh, the field of Jewish-Christian relations. Uh, there aren't many of us in that field, and so we're always overjoyed when people take a step, either on the Christian or the Jewish side, to do the deep work. It requires deep work, deep theological work, deep inner work, I think, for both communities to stretch out their hands in friendship and to increase their uh, spirituality as they reimagine uh, different theological positions. Uh, he is currently the executive director of the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation. And of course, we are delighted that uh, we had a little part to play in the origin story of that amazing center when I brought the very first group of pastors. I don't remember the year. I think it was 2004 um, uh, to spend some time with Rabbi Shlomo Riskin who is just a towering figure in modern Ju Judaism, uh, really the, the modern-day Nehemiah of Ephrat. And we went to do a 
you know what we did? We went to do a two hour, three hour Bishop and the rabbi before it was called Bishop and the rabbi. It was the rabbi and the pastors. That's what it was. The rabbi and the pastors. And we gathered together at a hotel in Jerusalem. And as we're sitting in the hotel, somebody gasps and they turn and they look out the window and snow is pouring down on the streets of Jerusalem. Now you very, very rarely see snow in the streets of Jerusalem, but it was pouring down. The entire city shut down and the rabbi who came for three hours stayed for three days. We were locked into the hotel. We couldn't go anywhere. And so this was the beginning of these deep friendships that joined together, this deep fellowship that came. It was the Buffalo anointing manifesting in Jerusalem. And, uh, and uh, that thus the concept for the center was launched in Rabbi Riskin's heart. Uh, Rabbi Pesach Wolicki is also a lecturer and academic consultant for the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. And of course, we remember Rabbi Eckstein uh, of blessed memory and his daughter Yael is doing such a wonderful job carrying on that legacy. Rabbi Wolicki has a wonderful book called The Cup of Salvation, and it is a devotional commentary on Tehillim 113 through 118, Psalms 113 through 118. We'll let you know how to get a hold of that book. Uh, he and his wife, Kate, live in Bet Shemesh, and they have eight children. They've been busy. So I want you to join me uh, and give a huge welcome tonight. Uh, all of us, as we welcome on in Rabbi Pesach Wolicki. Can you go ahead and give him a big welcome? How are you doing, Bishop? There you are, Rabbi. How are you, sir? <laughs> oh, I'm doing great. I love that expression, the buffalo anointing for snow. Yes. That's what, I think that's what I'm going to call snow from now on, the buffalo Very anointing. <laughs> Absolutely. What is snow in Hebrew? Sheleg. Sheleg. Sheleg? Shelig, exactly, perfect. Shelig, right. shin lamed right, gimel. Shelig. Yeah, that's all right. Snow. Shelig, and what's the etymology of the word? What is it? Uh... Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, it's it's a word in the Bible. Um, it it's the right. word for snow. Um, that's an interesting question because uh, you know, again, it's it, it itself is the root, so it's hard to know what the etymology is. I I've never thought about it. That's a good question. Interesting. Yeah, because I know that in Hebrew, a lot of times there are these root words, and then there's a lot of the words that, you know, kind sure. of, you know, reference off of them. And then there's the gematria and all that. So maybe sure. one day we'll need to do, a, we'll need to a, do a bishop and the rabbi about snow. Well, <laughs> Rabbi, I want to honor you. Uh, you have awakened the dawn at four o'clock in the morning. This is true dedication. This is true friendship. This is not easy. Uh, it's really the middle of the night there. And so you got up in the middle of the night just to spend time with us going. And uh, we're super, super grateful for that. And uh, I want to ask a couple questions before we dive into the Torah portion. I'm trying to see if Pastor Doug is joining us tonight. I thought he was going to be on with us. And uh, maybe he's, well, I only have comments for uh, Facebook. Maybe he's watching on YouTube. But um <laughs> I want to ask you a couple questions before we get into the Torah portion. Sure. Um, tell us a little bit. I mean, you don't have a thick Israeli accent. So I believe you were born on this side of the world. So I have two questions for you. Number one, what was your journey and process to discern your calling to become a rabbi? You know, you could have been a, an accountant, a teacher, a professional NBA player. I don't know, maybe not so much, but you know, you had all kinds of options, but you know, somewhere along the journey, you decided to follow the call to the rabbinate. And I would love, I think our listeners would love to understand how you unpacked that and, and processed that kind of calling on your life. And then secondarily, um, the same question, how did you discern the journey to go ahead and make Aliyah and to return, you know, was that before the eight children, after the eight children, you know, half and half, you know, so uh, we'd like to get to know you a little bit. So let's start with your background and then how you came to decide to, to be a rabbi. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you for asking, you know, very often when, when I teach or when I speak, people don't ask that question and 
you know, it, it is nice to get to know each other before we before we study together. So I was raised in a rabbinic home. My father is a rabbi as well. May he live and be well. He's now retired, lives around the corner from me here in Beit Shemesh. But at, you're correct. I was born in the United States. I was actually born in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, although right. I have it's not like I have any roots there. My father was a young rabbi at the time and and moving from pulpit to pulpit until he settled uh, in Canada. So I was I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, left there as a baby. But I was raised in Canada, lived in Montreal and then in Toronto. And uh, and my whole family moved to Israel. We didn't all move at the same time, but everyone moved to Israel sometime from the late 80s to the early 90s. One by one, we made it over there, myself, my brothers, my parents. Uh, so I moved to Israel. I made Aliyah in uh, 1994. Um, and the way... And so I just, how old, yeah. in 94, were you a rabbi yet? No, no, no. I was, I was just after college. I had worked for a couple, uh, I, I'd worked for a little more than a year. I was, uh, I was a, I was a Jewish political activist, as it were. I was very involved in, uh, in all kinds of activist activity, uh, raising awareness about anti-Semitism. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of stories we could go down that rabbit hole, but I was very involved in, in, Jewish uh, concerns, and I made Aliyah in 1994 and immediately took a position leading a campaign to raise awareness about, about Israel's missing soldiers uh, right. and uh, working with the families of Israeli MIAs. I'm sure you remember them, the Baumel family yes. and the other families that were involved. So that, that's what I did uh, as, as a job, you know, uh, lobbying and, and, uh, and doing public protests and all kinds of things like that. So that's what I was I was busy with. And I really viewed my career, my future in some sort of public advocacy for Israel. That was what I mm -hmm. wanted to be doing. Um, all the all the older people in my life, all the adults in my life kind of knew that I was going to become a rabbi. Uh, I was if you had asked me at the time, I was resistant to it. Maybe that's because I was raised as the son of a rabbi. And uh, right. I, I didn't you know, I didn't want to. It was in my mind the last thing I wanted to do. But at some point um, in around uh, 95, 96, in that, in that time period, I realized that uh, if I'm going to be involved in communal leadership in any way, real communal leadership should have a strong spiritual base behind it. And again, raised in a rabbinic home, I was always studying Talmud. I was always, you know, I spent a few hours. How many hours brothers and sisters? I'm the youngest of five. Okay. Five brothers, all boys, all brothers, all boys. Okay, right. and, all right. And and no one else became a rabbi. Uh, but really, uh, yeah. And so that was so that was my journey to being a rabbi, where I was just I wanted to be involved in communal leadership. But from a spiritual perspective, I believe that leaders should be spiritual leaders and should have a spiritual base behind them. And uh, so I I studied for rabbinic ordination in Jerusalem. Was ordained by the chief rabbi of Jerusalem at the time, and. Uh, and my goal was to go right back into political activism, but I got sidetracked for a few years. I went back to the States. I met my wife during that time in Israel. My wife's from Boston, but she was studying in Israel at the time. And uh, we had our first two children while I was finishing up my ordination. And then we went back to this. Uh, we went back to the States for about five years where I worked as a rabbi in a few small communities and then moved back to Israel in 2003. Uh, so. And that's a bit and of my so journey. Were you raised Orthodox or modern Orthodox? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I've been an Orthodox Jew my whole life. My father's an Orthodox rabbi. Um, but but and, I'm, uh, I'm asking you to make a differentiation for us because we're learning kind of some of the differences between uh, classical Orthodoxy versus modern Orthodox. Oh, what yeah. Modern your, Orthodox. So you were raised, raised modern. I've been raised modern Orthodox. My father's a modern Orthodox rabbi. In fact, you mentioned Rabbi Riskin before uh, from Efrat. Uh, Rabbi Riskin and my father grew up together and were in the same class from from when they were about, uh, I don't know, 10, 11 years old until they finished rabbinical ordination uh, and remain close friends to this day. Uh, and they're really from the same school of thought, the modern Orthodox tradition. Uh, my father is a student of Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, so, yeah, I was raised in modern Orthodoxy. And, uh, and that really has a lot to do with where I am today, because modern Orthodoxy is a brand of orthodoxy that very much embraces the changes that are going on in the world, the, the, the 
perhaps the greatest change of all is modern Zionism and the state of Israel and understanding it as a fulfillment of, of biblical prophecy. So I was raised right. with that mindset. So when you asked the second question you asked about making Aliyah, I was raised in a home that even all those years that I was growing up in Canada, uh, the, the, the table conversation always revolved around Israel. It was, it was a kind of default assumption that when I got older, at some point, we would all move to Israel. And that, right. that is where I was going to make my future. Uh, gotcha. I never envisioned my future anywhere else. Gotcha. Well, um, I want to thank Ben, our producer. Ben does such a great job. And he just fixed, I had some buttons wrong on my computer. And all of a sudden, now everybody has appeared. So I want to welcome Pastor Joe Green from Tennessee. Ken from Eden, New York. Deborah from Arkwright, New York. Cecilia is with us tonight. A whole bunch of people who I did not see before. Hi, hello, Laverne. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, Rebecca. Terry Lay Ogle is saying she was there. She was in a fraught. Yes, you were. Yes, Janice, it was a divine snowstorm. Hi, Kristen. God bless you. Um, Florida, Mayui is with us from uh, Palm Beach, Florida. All kinds of great folks in the room. And Pastor Doug Reed is here. He is live and in the room. <laughs> Pastor Doug, you're amazing, and we just thank God for you, and we thank God that God has brought you to Buffalo. Hello, Carol Moreau from Greenfield Township. Reggie Stutzman, our brother from um, New York City. Uh, Amy's here from Baltimore. Wow, lots of folks in the room. Uh, hit the share button, folks. Not enough of you have shared, uh, so go ahead and hit the share button if you will. Rabbi, it's a fascinating story, and so let me just ask you this. When you were growing up, son of a rabbi, uh, youngest of five in an orthodox home, getting your smicha in the heart of Yerushalayim, uh, believing that you're going to be a, a shomrei achumot, you're going to be a watchman, a defender of Israel, you're going to be involved. Did you ever envision that you'd be hanging out with Christians as much as you do? <laughs> was this a part of your, did you think this was going to unfold this way? Well, that's a great question. My exposure to Christians really began when I was working uh, on behalf of missing Israeli soldiers with the families of Israeli MIAs. And at the time, it was, it was 1994, 95. It was that time period. It was the beginning of what's called the peace process, the Oslo process. I don't, right. like, calling, I don't like calling it the peace process because it didn't really lead to any kind of peace. But right. when that was all going on in the in the mid 90s, early to mid 90s, it was when we were active and there were Christian Zionists in Jerusalem at the International Christian Embassy and at Bridges. That, for those Peace. were the years. Rich, sorry to interrupt you. Those were the years where I first came to Israel. My first trip ah. was in 19. It was 1991-92, and then I was a worship leader and a speaker and. Um, in, on the worship team for the Feast of Tabernacles each year ah. during those years in the 90s. So we, you know, we might have been in the same room together. We might have season. been, we might have been, and the, and the staff at the Christian Embassy were people that I knew very well during that time period. We probably have a lot of old friends in common. Those were that. the, those were the years of Johann Lukoff and Jan Willem and, van der Hoeven. Jan Willem van der Hoeven, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Jan Absolutely. Willem was really a mentor to me. He was one of my early mentors. He had a profound impact on me spiritually. He's still alive. Uh, he oh, and, really? He and his, wow. Yes, he's still, he's, he lives uh, there in, I want to, I think he lives in Ariel and, um, and Mervyn Merla Watson, who were very, I, very involved in the early days. I'm These in touch with pioneers. Mervyn Merla. I'm yep. in touch with Mervyn Merla. They're, they're good friends of mine. Wonderful people. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I felt it was, it was so, it's one of the things that I just thank God for that. Um, I mean, I was just a young kid, you know, I was, I was, I was very young. I was in my very, very early twenties and I feel like I got to be, that was such a critical moment because, you know, what? you had the, you had the Intifada, you had the Oslo Accords, you know, all of this was going on and all of a sudden Christians are just coming in mass, you know, mm -hmm. and it was like the Jewish community finally is like, who are you people? You know, and there was, that Absolutely. was really the beginning That's so that's my story. Dialogue. I'm yeah. one of those who are you people, who are you people, people. When we were approached by some of these Christians and we were and we were approached by them, we we needed allies. We needed people to help our cause. 
and some of these Christian activists, uh, representatives of the Christian embassy, came to us and said, we'd like to help you. We care about the missing Israeli soldiers. My first reaction was suspicion. I was just like, okay, wh wh what's the agenda here? What do you really want? And I remember I went to speak to my dad at the time, and he basically said, you know, be careful. These are Christians. You never know what their agenda is. And when I started, when I started spending time with these Christians. And I went to Washington, D.C. For a, for a gathering of, of, of Christian Zionist leaders. It, it was really the first such gathering uh, in, in D.C. in 1995. And I spent time with these people. I said to myself, wow, you know, there is really something special going on here. And remember, Bishop, that I was coming from a, from a rabbinic background. I, I studied Talmud a few hours every day before going to the office. I was already I, th there was a lot of rabbinic, inf uh, you know, Torah and and theology in my head already, even though I wasn't officially becoming a rabbi yet. So I was interpreting everything I was seeing through a through a biblical and theological lens, and I started rethinking some of the things that I was raised with and some of the some of the words that I said every day about the kingdom of God and about all people on earth, all rec all serving God shoulder to shoulder. When I started. I started thinking about these things and saying, wait a second, there's a change going on in the Christian world. It's small right now, but this looks like the beginning of something big, and I wanted to be a part of it. So even though I then left the world of political activism, I then went on to a rabbinic career, and, and I went into a career in Jewish education, uh, essentially teaching Talmud for many years, I never, I never lost the passion for Christians. And I, it would, became a very critical part of my theology. All the years that I was teaching, uh, my teaching students Talmud, I would always talk about the importance of looking at what's going on in the Christian world and that ultimately these are our partners. So when I decided to eventually leave the world of Jewish education, it was a no-brainer for me to go right back in uh, to the relationship with Christians. But that, that all was the result of them reaching out to us uh, reaching out a hand to us and saying, we want to help you with the cause of the missing soldiers back in the 90s. We're having a fascinating conversation tonight with our dear friend, Rabbi Pesach Waliki, who is the executive director of the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation based out of Or Torah Stone, founded by Rabbi Shlomo Riskin and now led by our dear friend, Rabbi Kenneth Brander, uh, who we were just with a few months ago. We shared a dinner together and a impromptu Torah session together in Jerusalem. And I'm so grateful that my comments are now on and I can see everybody and everything's now working because uh, technology is wonderful when it works. And yes, Jennifer, absolutely recognizing the signs of the times. I'm sitting here listening to Rabbi and I'm just reminded of that, you know, that Issachar anointing, right? To understand the times. Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do to have this discerning awareness of what is happening around us. And Rabbi is very vulnerably sharing with us tonight that, you know, part of what um, he had to wrestle with theologically as, as Israel is reborn and as the modern uh, diaspora returns home, well, the same verses, the exact same verses that prophesy the Jews coming home and the walls of Yerushalayim being rebuilt, are the verses that say that they're going to come from all nations and that it's going to be a house of prayer for all nations and that uh, Ten Goyim will take a hold of one Jew by the garment and say, we have heard that God is with you. Let us go with you. All of these prophetic things, um, uh, it's, it's jointly connected that uh, the nations will stream to Yerushalayim. And so part of what the Jews need to grapple with, right? Like Christians Amen. need to grapple with our theology, uh, you know, our challenges. Well, but they don't, they don't agree that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, we've got, you know, that's, that's a conundrum for us. That's a, that's a challenge for us. Well, the Jews have got to deal with their own challenges in this. Well, I thought we were the Jew chosen people and Jerusalem was just for us. Well, you know, certainly you're the firstborn, but, but God loves all of his children and he's making a way for all of his children. So, uh, it's fascinating. It's amazing. And Rabbi, we're so blessed uh, to have you, a man of your depth and your history, um, uh, 
in the space that you are occupying in this global dialogue. Now, Rabbi, we, uh, we've got to go quickly now. Time always escapes us. But this Sunday, uh, let me just say this, everybody. We're in Parsha Devarim, okay? So Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, Parsha Devarim. Devarim means the sayings or the words. So these are the, the sayings of Moses. This is a book very explicitly written by Moshe. Uh, it says, right, and these are the words of Moses. The words Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert. And Deuteronomy is really Moses' recapping of all of the story, all of the epic drama. It's, it's, it's Moses' Lord of the Rings moment, okay, as he just brings forth this epic journey that he's been on. Um, and um, so that's where we may touch on that in a little bit, and we will. But I want to begin kind of backwards, Rabbi, for a moment, which is I want to look at this coming Sunday, 72 hours from now, 48 hours from whatever it is. We are coming to a very difficult day, a dark day, a hard day, a fast day. We're coming to Tisha B'Av. And this is really, I mean, this is like the most ominous day in a sense, the most sober. Um, I mean, Yom Kippur has a sense of holiness. It has a sense of the uh, would you say the Kedushim or the Kadosh of God? It has a sense of the holiness of God. But Yom Kippur has a sense of redemption to it and a sense Absolutely. of, you know, a sense of meeting with God in the Selah. But Tisha B'Av is, is kind of one of these. God is angry and we better, you know, we better understand that. So unpack for us this coming Sunday, Tisha B'Av, because it's it's a crucial day in the history of the Jewish people. Absolutely. Um, Tisha B'Av is the anniversary of, remarkably, it's the anniversary of both the destruction of the first temple and the destruction of the second temple. And that itself, if you just pause there and, and let that sink in for a moment, that these two temples were destroyed many centuries apart, one by the Babylonians, one by the Romans. They weren't looking at the Jewish calendar and picking the date. But it right. just so happened that on the exact same calendar date, on the Hebrew calendar, both temples were destroyed centuries apart. And that's obviously God sending in a very clear message. So, you know, in the darkness and the tragedy of the destruction of those two temples, there's also a ray of light. And the ray of light is the fact that God is speaking clearly to us. Uh, mm. So even... Even in anger, you know, good. God, you, you mentioned good. that it's a day of God's anger. And there were, there were other tragedies that happened on that date throughout Jewish history. And what we have done with that day through our tradition is, is all of the tragedies of Jewish history, whether it's the Crusades where so many Jews were massacred or the Holocaust or many other tragedies in Jewish history, we mourn all of them on Tisha B'Av, not because we're saying they all happened on Tisha B'Av, but we understand that they're all part of the same issue that culminates on Tisha B'Av, which is when we are when we stray from from what God wants us to be doing, God lashes out at us, and He lashes out at us because He loves us. I, if I could just drill down on that comment for a moment, if you're you know if you're if you're uh, sitting on a park bench at a playground. And there's children playing and there's some adults sitting off to the side in the shade and some child starts misbehaving and you see one of the adults get up and start screaming and get really angry you probably can assume that that adult is that child's parent right the other adults aren't going to be screaming at the kid the one who's right. angry is is the one who loves the child and that's really where the anger comes from so our understanding of God's anger, as much as we don't want to incur the wrath of God, and it's obviously tragic, and, Jew and Jews are no strangers to tragedy, but there's nothing, has, there's nothing that shakes our faith in our covenant as a result of God's anger. We know that God's anger comes from the place of a special relationship that we have with him. So, yeah. Well, you know, so and it's wrap tough. No, 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 I've got you. Yeah, you broke up for just a second. Um yeah. No, no, no. Uh, you, you, you're hitting the nail on the head. But just to go back to what you said a moment ago, it, it isn't um, only that you uh, and you said this, but I want to underline it. So I'm, I'm affirming the point that you made. 
It isn't only that you assign to this day things that happen, but literally other tragedies such as Kristallnacht, even in the modern world. Am I right on that? Even in the modern world, um, terrible things have befallen the Jewish people on this day. Is that accurate? Many, many terrible things have happened on this day. And, yeah. you know, this is the way this is the way God's time clock works. You know, there are right. certain we don't when we commemorate historical events, whether it's the exodus from Egypt on Passover or the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, on Pentecost, on Shavuot or or the destruction of the temple on, on Tisha B'Av in the in our theological understanding of dates on the calendar. It's not that we're reminiscing or reminding ourselves of a historical event it's that the energy the spiritual energy the divine energy in. that produced right. that produced those events is is in, is part of those days it's there every year Folks, you can, i want you to hear this because this is tap, the this is the 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 brilliance and the comprehensiveness of judaism that that we, if you tap into this, folks, it's so amazing because we we talk in our parlance so much about spiritual warfare. We talk about generational curses. We have this understanding of the mystical world. We we understand that we understand that these forces are real. The forces of darkness are real. But what you know, what are these demons? Are these demons little gremlins that kind of run around like on a on a, on a horror movie? No. This is energy that these are these are entities, energies in the universe that find an access into our world through some type of rebellion against God, through type some type of sin, whatever. And until that is closed, until that is and until that is uh, done away with, uh, there's there's challenges. So, Absolutely. Rabbi, it's so important. And so, Rabbi, bring us to the foundation. So, so if all this bad energy is out there on this day, tell us what is the Jewish theory or the Jewish understanding of where that came from? Oh, that's a great question. And it, that question brings us right into the Torah portion. So just in case anyone's thinking that, wait a second, isn't this supposed to be about the weekly Torah portion? It is. The weekly Torah portion aligns perfectly with what's going on on the calendar. In this week's Torah portion, the very first incident that Moses recounts to the people of Israel, and of course, the book of Deuteronomy is speeches that Moses gave to the people of Israel during the last five weeks of his life. This is his last, his last uh, time to talk to them. And the very first incident he recounts to them, because he does not do it chronologically. He doesn't start with the Exodus and then go to the giving of the Torah. He, he speaks to them about what we call the sin of the spies. When the, when the spies were sent to the land of Israel and came back with a negative report, and the people all despaired and cried and lost faith. Right. And that event, if you do the calculation, and, and this is not just a rabbinic tradition. If you sit down with the Bible and you figure out the dates of when everything took place, because the Bible tells us when different things happen. You have to do the work to figure it out. You'll discover that when the spies return and give that negative report and the people of Israel all despair and give up hope and say, we can't go into the land. We can't defeat them, and they despair. That took place on Tisha B'Av, on the ninth of Av, and that's when God decreed that they that that generation would not inherit the land, and it would be the future generations that would inherit the land. That tragedy, that's the genesis. That's the initial uh, uh, burst of this negative, destructive energy, this rebellious energy, and God's anger lashing out at us for for that despair and rebellion that begins with the sin of the spies so everything that happens uh, after that the destruction of the temple is coming from the same place when when the jewish people give up their faith and despair that's when the negative energy the destructive energy kicks in and that's what Tisha B'Av is about. So when we're, when we're recounting all of the tragedies that took place throughout Jewish history on Tisha B'Av, we're not doing it from a standpoint of saying, woe is me, it's so hard to be a Jew. We're doing it from the standpoint of saying, this is what happens when we're weak in our faith. This is what happens when we despair. This is what happens when we turn our back on, on God's promises to us. 
and we lose our courage and we lose our faith. This is what happens. And, it, and Tisha B'Av is the culmination. And, and, Rabbi, and Rabbi, this is what happens when we speak words of death and negativity Amen. instead of words of faith and hope. Uh, you know, someone has said that Hashem created the world with his words and we create our world with our words. Oh, beautiful. You know, I love it. The, the, the Bible says that life and death are in the power of the ton. And so what we speak, what we allow to come out of our mouth is so crucial. So you say, well, how could this bad energy still be around all these thousands? Well, the question is, what are we speaking today that is a negative report? What are we speaking today that is bringing doubt, that is bringing despair, that is bringing limitation, that is bringing a hopelessness? We have to lift our eyes. I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my self. My hope comes from the Lord. My help comes from him. We have to lift our soul, lift our soul to God and bring our being into alignment with the words of Hashem. And this is what Joshua and Caleb did. They, right. they viewed and they spoke from a heavenly perspective. And folks, I want to tell you, you've got to remember that they were in the minority. They were in the minority. <laughs> Rabbi, I tell us all the time, the, this book, cover to cover, the majority gets it wrong and the minority <laughs> is just holding on for dear life in faith in God. The majority is always messing up. So, folks, be very cautious if a majority is moving in one direction, uh, because usually it is the minority who's in touch with heaven who are bringing the good report of the Lord. Um, so, Rabbi, do you agree that the, the power of our words, the power of what we speak is so crucial? Oh, for sure. We create our reality and everything that we everything that we feel and everything that we do is the result of the things that we say and and the things that we say like you said it, it really does it, it creates the reality in this particular case when the spies come back and they say what they say and everyone just gives up hope caleb and joshua didn't refute if you go back to what they said there in the book of numbers they don't refute any of the claims it's not like one side was saying oh you know the Canaanites are really powerful. We can't conquer it. And Caleb and Joshua said, no, here's a battle plan where we could. Caleb and Joshua's argument was very simple. God said we can do this. And if God said we can do this, it is, it's inconceivable to say that we can't. That's really their whole argument. Their argument is yeah. trust in God. And, and that's something that we have to realize. When we look at the state of Israel today and, and all the enemies that surround us or if we look at all the crises that are going on in the Western world, in the United States today, there's a, you know, the world's a very unstable place. And there's a lot of reasons to say, I can't, we can't, it's going to be a disaster. This is terrible. Look, as people of faith, one thing that we know is that the end of the story is good. That's what we know. We know that as people of faith. And therefore, there can be no such thing as despair. There can be no such thing as we can't. It's our job to trust in God and to move forward. And that's really the message of the sin of the spies. Well, and I don't want to get too deep into it, Rabbi, and I don't want to politicize this. But I feel that a huge part of the instability of today's world is, is stemming from people, whatever their background people viewing themselves as victims, uh, people viewing themselves as inferior, as disenfranchised, as victims, as marginalized. And instead of, that may be real, but instead of taking that and using that force to propel them toward greatness, because every pain is an invitation to greatness, it feels to me like there's a web of victimhood that is just covering the planet and th this group is victimized and that group is victimized and this group is inferior and that group is attacked. And there's just this cloud of negativity um, that, that feels to be kind of descending on us as a people. 
And um, I just think all the more that we need the spirit of Joshua and Caleb in us um, to speak words of life and words of faith and words of hope. I, you know, that's a beautiful point that you're making about victimhood, because vic viewing myself as a victim causes two things. It, it causes me to blame other people for my predicament. That's right. Because I'm a victim. And the other thing is that it, it causes me to believe that I can't do anything about it. It causes despair. Yep. And, you know, I was once asked a question by someone who who uh, was not raised as an Orthodox Jew, they were not raised as a, as a person of faith and they came to the faith. And as they were learning about it, they were very bothered. They were reading a, a book uh, of, of Jewish theology about the Holocaust. And in this book, it's, it, it said that, you know, these things, these tragedies happen because of our sins, because of our sinfulness. That's why these tragedies mm -hmm. happen. And he said to me, how, how come we're letting the Nazis off the hook? How come, how come we're taking the blame for this? We were victims. So I said to the person, I said, look, I said, it's true. The Nazis deserve whatever punishment they get. And just like the Egyptians, the Egyptians deserve to get punished. Well, folks, I don't know if you can still hear me, uh, but we have... Uh, Rabbi has frozen on us for a moment. Apparently, God wants us to really get the point that he's making. So God has given us a pause. Uh, Rabbi, if you can hear us, you are frozen. Can you all hear me? Go ahead and type in and let me know if you can hear me. We are speaking tonight uh, live from Jerusalem with Rabbi Pesach Wiliki. And uh, he, he, okay, so you can hear me. So it's just Rabbi who's frozen. We'll get, yes, Amy, it's a cliffhanger. That is, <laughs> Amy, that's great. We're at a cliffhanger moment. Um, uh, but we are talking about a Tisha B'Av, and we're talking about the importance of our words. Tisha B'Av is a day throughout history where tragedies, horrible tragedies, have befallen the Jewish people. And uh, Rabbi's explaining to us that the root of this stems all the way back to the time that the 10 spies came back and brought a negative report, and only two, Joshua and Caleb, brought a positive report, a, a report of victory. We're going to try to get the rabbi back online right now, uh, so just give us a moment as we do. But as we do that, let me just give you a, a few quick updates. I want to let you know we need to be in prayer. I got a phone call today, an urgent, urgent phone call. And this is actually a very good moment for us to um, talk about this as we're getting Rabbi back on. Uh, but Hi, as sorry. you know, uh, oh, there he is, Rabbi. Let me just make oh, this sorry. one announcement, Rabbi, because I'm halfway through it. Then we'll go right back to you. Sure. Uh, but as you know, we've been supporting the, the brave freedom fighters in Iran who are opposing the religious totalitarian government there. And um, the current... Uh, a head of the government, the, the president, Raisi, he's a mass murderer. He's a madman. He's a war criminal. And they're preparing to welcome him to the United Nations, which we like to call the United uh, Condemnations, because all they do is condemn everyone else and don't look at themselves. Uh, I want you to begin praying that God blocks Raisi from entering the United States. We should not allow him to enter our airspace. We should not allow him into New York. And we're going to be talking more about this over the coming weeks. Um, but I want you to be following it on the news cycle. I think his name is spelled R-A-I-S-I. -I, uh, but he is a sworn enemy of Israel. He's a sworn enemy of the Christian church. He is a a uh, known killer, and uh, we need to stand against him being allowed um, to come to New York and to come to the UN. So we'll hear more about that. Rabbi, um, our time is slipping away. I think we have you. Well, do we have him back? Rabbi, are you there? We had him, and then we didn't. Yeah. All right. Well, Rabbi, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? 
Uh, we can kind of hear you. you. You're freezing in and out, but we can now. We can hear you now. Hello? Yes. Apparently, there's a delay. But, Rabbi, if you can hear me, okay. go ahead and give us can you hear me now? some last oh. – Yes. Give us some last words, some last comments on the Porsche and the, on the Parsha, and then we'll wrap up. All right. Well, we we will we will have Rabbi. Well, are you there? So the 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 point I was making was that yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So the point I was making is that when we when we view ourselves as victims of others, it prevents us from using our own human agency to do something about it. And I think that's a that's the big message that we need to take with the sin of the spies. And in fact, Moses himself, he also despairs. Moses falls on his face and Aaron falls on his face and they, and they gave up hope not in God. They gave up hope in the people. And it was Joshua who stood up and said, we can do it and started and, and was pushing forward. And I think that that's why in, in this week's Torah portion, when Moses is recounting the story, he he uses the sin of the spies as an opportunity to say, to remind everyone that he is not going to lead them into the land, but that Joshua will. And I think that's Moses himself saying, a leader can't lose hope in his people, and the people can't lose hope in God. We have to have faith. God, leaders have to have faith in the people. The people have to have faith in God and faith in themselves. Seeing ourselves as victims is the opposite of all of that. We're created in the image of God, and that means that we have to take agency, we have to take control, and God wants us to do that. That is, that's the nobility of the human being, and that's where we need to move forward. So, so Tisha B'Av is a time for us to reflect on how we have lost hope, we have lost faith, and led ourselves into, into tragedies. The fact that others are also to blame for them is not our concern. Our concern is fixing our relationship to God and gaining strength from that faith so that we can fight the battles that we have ahead. Rabbi, it's so well said. Uh, and folks, uh, we have run out of time, but we're, we're definitely encouraged by Rabbi's words. Rabbi, people are going to want to follow you. They're going to want to follow your podcast. They're going to want to follow you on social media. They're going to want to purchase your book. How do they find you and connect to your wonderful work? Well, thank you for, for asking that, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, in terms of the book, you can find it on Amazon. It's called Cup of Salvation. Uh, and uh, again, it's a line-by-line -line devotional commentary on, uh, on Psalms 113 through 118, which is the Hallel Psalms. And you also get to know me in the book, the introduction. I really tell my whole story. You can follow the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation on Facebook, and you'll really get a lot of updates there. And the best way to follow me is to follow, is to listen to the weekly podcast that I co-host with Pastor Doug Reed, who you who you mentioned, who's on, uh, who's uh, joining uh, your team there. Uh, so Pastor Doug and I, every week we discuss issues that matter to people of faith. We bring on different guests. You've been a guest on our show. Thank you for that. Uh, and we talk about all kinds of issues that relate to Israel or just life, uh, a life of faith in general, sometimes theological sometimes cultural or political issues. So that's the best way to follow me. Go onto Facebook and join the Shoulder to Shoulder community. Find the podcast, any podcast platform. Again, it's called Shoulder to Shoulder. And that's really, again, the best way to stay in touch with me. Well, and uh, our incredible team, thank you to Dina D. Pasquale. She has put all of that into the comments. So you can go ahead and link there to purchase Rabbi's book and to follow along with the podcast and the great continuing work of the Center for Jewish Understanding and Cooperation. And uh, so you'll stay in touch with Rabbi uh, uh, Walicki. And Rabbi, may, may we meet again in Jerusalem in a snowstorm. May there be a another great, great another great, Sheleg, Sheleg? I think it was Sheleg, however you say snow. All right. Folks, it's been an incredible night. It's been great to be together with our new friend. A buffalo anointing. <laughs> yes. That's it. Shella, exactly. That is it. 
All right. That's Folks, correct. it's been awesome. to be. It's been great to be with Rabbi. Rabbi, I hope that you'll come back and teach us again. We would love to have you again with us. And uh, it's an important moment in history as we're coming together and we're ascending the hill of the Lord. Thank you for being here tonight. Remember, everybody, keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Good night, everybody.